South Africa's land offers a glorious bounty, which is currently being eroded at an alarming rate by senseless and often brutal attacks on those who till the land. No longer can we turn a blind eye as the spate of farm attacks continue to rise. I took the mess away and put the pistol in my cup. And then he said to me, what do you have to listen to? I'm going to kill you today. But while the other people here or after the steak and the other from before the clay, did you not have to go up and go up and go up. Now, at the end of the day, I bid you, because I am a Christian and I say, God help us. And I say, do you help me? And that is the system of the human life. And what for me say, spill to it. I think I have no other way to do it. And then I thought I better just call my husband, you know. So I looked at him and I and um, and I, I accepted for him, I can sleep for you, you know, I love you. And he said, I love you. And then this guy just shot him. I mean he just shot him. He was an elderly man, um, he was in his late uh, I think he was in his late eighties and um, he was tortured for almost nine hours in his house. Um, when we arrived at the scene, his nail marks were stuck in the carpets um, throughout the, the house. And that day changed my entire way of thinking about farm attacks because no one can come and show me where that happens so regularly in any form of city robbery um, or urban area in this country. Farmers are under siege. They mostly live in isolated rural areas where infrastructure has collapsed and support services such as a functional police force, medical and welfare services are sadly lacking and abject poverty is showing a steep upwards curve. Farm attacks are really bad. Um, yeah. Going to into specific details is very difficult, but um, it really impacts the whole community. It's not just the farms, it's the people living in the towns. Everybody has to be prepared. Everybody is uh, on edge. A lot of security measures, a lot of, um, you know, bad feelings, a lot of uh, anxiety going around town and on the farms, especially with the older people. A lot of them are, are moving away, uh, stop farming. Um, a lot of people are sitting without jobs just because they are scared of an attack. Uh, farm violence and violence against farmers and, and farm workers is something that is unacceptable. We have um, recently had a meeting at the World Farmers Organization where we've actually tabled this as a, as a crime against humanity and, and, uh, and our motion was accepted. Uh, so, so I think for us, it's uh, given that we have a constitution and the rule of law, and that we live in a civilization where we, where we, where we want to prosper. Uh, violence against farmers or farm workers on farms are, are, not, are not on. Now, to me, there, there is a clear link between the high levels of violent crime that we see generally in the country, the huge increases since 2011-12, and also the concomitant increases that we've seen in farm attacks and farm murders. The, the closing down of the commando system was probably the biggest uh, mistake that, that was made by our government uh, in relation to the situation in our rural areas and specifically on crimes and small, uh, on farms and small holdings. Now, we know that in 2003, President Mbeki made this unexpected announcement in Parliament. We announced that the commanders will be phased out over the next five to six years and will be replaced by alternative police structures. Now, I can tell you I was in the police at that time. I was responsible for rural safety at the time and I had no idea what he was talking about. But what we said is that we need to find a way within the legal framework to, to be able to stop crime, prevent crime and, and combat crime as far as we can. We then started um, looking into training specifically for communities and seeing how we can train different community groups to be able to act within the legal framework um, if crime should occur or how and what they need to do um, to stop crime before it happens. Rural safety, um, as the police know it, does not function the way it should. It doesn't have resources. 
Many of the vehicles the cops have to use um, have more than 350,000 uh, kilometers on them. They don't get maintained, they don't get replaced, um, they don't have manpower, their overtime is is way too much. You've got cops that are completely burnt out. You've got detectives um, that start out of the college with more than 300 dockets on a table. It's impossible for any human being to be able to work under that type of pressure. Um, and then the amount of trauma they go through. There's no form of, of, of debriefing that they go through. Um, not enough in any case. The South African Police Service only has one clinical psychologist left in the entire South African Police Service. Um, you've got almost 150,000 operational members in the country. Um, how on earth can you keep them sane with one clinical psychologist with no debriefing whatsoever happening on station level? Met die laatste plaas aanval hier, het hulle dood eenvoudig nie ontplooi nie. Daar was een speerder wat uitgegaan het na die, na die toneel toe. Daar was nie eens polisman om die toneel te beveilig nie. Daar was niks. En hulle dood eenvoudig gesê, hulle het nie mannekracht by die polistasie of voertuie om uit te gaan soen toe. Ek dink, as ons, as ons daarna kyk, dan is die probleem waarmee ons sit, is dat jy is totaal op jouself aangewees. Vroeger is daar patrolies gerei in die gebied. Daar is moeite gedoen van die politiese kant af. As jy die politie gebel het, het hulle geantwoord. Hulle antwoord nie eers nie. So, ons sit in een situasie met die hele kriminele activiteit, of het nou gaan oor uh, veerdiefstal, of het nou gaan oor wat, hulle rapporteer nie die sake nie, hulle teken dit nie aan in hulle registers nie, so dit lyk baie goed. Ons probeer geruime tyd om die stasie opgegradeerd te kry na een groter stasie toe. Ons kom nergens daarmee nie, want die politie intern lok nie die, die, die misdrywe wat aan hulle gerapporteer word nie. Ja, as my vrou, my vrou is op teker op die dorp, as sy half vijf by die dorp, an, of by die plaas aankom, eerste ding wat sy doen, sy stap kluis, sy haal haar pistool uit, maak seker, sy het nog een extra magazijn by haar, dan beweeg sy rond op die, op die werf, en sy gee haar hoenderskos, en sy gaan na alles toe, dan gaan sy in die huis in, sy is om trons die uur en half bezig, voor sy onder, want sy onder is gewoon die tyd wat naar die plaas aanvallen uitvoer, want nadat hy die mense seer gemaakt het en geroof het, of wat hy ook al wil doen, het hy hele nacht om te haar klip, Ach, wanneer ek hoor in die aande, daar is iets buiten, gaan ek uit trek my bulletproof aan, ek het dit battle jacket wat ek boer aantrek, waar my pistool voor hem kom, met my handradio, ek het die earpiece, my vrou sluit my uit die huis uit. En ek kan jy altyd met al praat, waar is ek? Ek sit vir 5 meter by my deur met my hond, as buiten die deur, dat my ook kan gewoon raak aan die donkerte. Die hond by my, is my eerste waarschuwing, want hulle is baie goeie sintuie, en my vrou weet ook, wanneer ek aangeval word, of sy kan my nie meer op die radio roep nie, kom sy nie uit nie, sy bly in die huis, en dan, die reaksie ouwens word dan moet publiseer en hulle sal my die toneel te kom. Dit is die situasie waar ons elke dag lewe. Om so te sê, ek het begemoeg raak om te hoor kolkort van ons plaas aanvallen, uh, plaas moorde. Baie van ons wit volk wat nie vir hulle self mee kan opstaan nie. Ek vat soos wat ons onlangs kan hoor, dit is toch die ou mense wat geteiken word. Um, ons het nie meer rarig die jongmanne wat wil meer rarig uh, in hierdie bedrijf ingaan nie. Um, daarom het ek maar besluit dat dit vir my gevoel is roeping dis hoekom ek hier is uh, daar is kere wat een mens kan bang raak um, ek vat hierdie werk het nogal sy manier om op een mens te werk uh, maar toch is ons nog daar um, en ek sal daar wees tot en met ja, wat ek nie meer het kan eendag doen nie ek vat dit is my passie om kriminele achtertralies te kan sit um, en ek sal enig iets doen om het te kan recht kry it's a fact that the majority of people that are attacked on farms are white. Um, there's no doubt. I think we need to stop shying away from that. We do see that the influence that it has on workers is, is very detrimental. If a farmer is killed, it can take up to five years for that farm to become commercially active again and viable again, um, which you can imagine what impact that has on the community, on the local community. It leaves everyone jobless. Um, it's important that we consider the amount of trauma that the workers go through in this and that many of them are attacked too. But the fact of the matter is that the majority of people that are attacked are farmers and the majority of those that are attacked are white. In 1997, on the 30th of November, a, on a Sunday afternoon, a cousin of ours was murdered cold-bloodedly on his farm near Swazirenika. My daughter was then 10 years old. 
And since that night, she's never slept in her room. If I can tell you quickly about the, the incident at Masharu Dorp, uh, Waterfall Boven, where Dries Boota was, was tortured, um, that happened on the Wednesday. We only got to him on the Thursday after his wife freed herself and got loose and went to get help. And our neighborhood watch self took 20 minutes to cut that person, to cut Dries loose from the barbed wire that he was bound against the pole outside where he slept, where he was left to die. Uh, Dries only died a few days later. But we caught that, that main suspect on the Friday afternoon that was caught. So yes, we might, we, we, we might not be able to, to stop it before it happens. But for me, I, I sleep better at night in the sense of knowing that I will get you. If you touch one of our members, we will catch you and we will get you. There is little doubt that farmers are being killed at a higher rate than any other section of the population in our beautiful and diverse country. Between April 2016 and March 2017, 357 farm attacks were recorded and 74 farmers were murdered. Dit het plus minus ek half een omtrend wakker geskrik. Uh, van een geluid. Eers het ek het in die skatte boop die dak, want die is een kat met kleinkies. En toe luis, toe hoor ek nie. Alle kap, alle kap. En toe grip ek my cellfoon. Uh, ek het die licht al, toe my kamer licht aangeskakel. Toe grip ek my cellfoon. En ek druk sy noodknoppie, want dit is met die bure en mense verbind. En toe grijp ek my gewone telefoon en ek bel my biervrou, want hulle is die naaste aan my. En toe sê ek vir hulle, hulle moet dadelijk kom, hulle is bezig om die in te breek. En sy hoor dit ook. Toe laat klaar hierdie twee, die sekreteitsdeur en jou die hier al klaar opgebreek. Toe sê ek met die sekreteitsdeur, toe hoor ek stemme. En ek hard loop en ek haal my revolver uit. Ek het ek drie of vier schoot het in my kamer dier geskiet. Toe skreek vir hulle gaan hulle doodskiet. Hulle moet uit my huis uit pad gee. En ek het net gehoor kom hulle, hulle kom al hoe nader. En die volgende oom dat toe begin my kamer dier af, af te breek ook. Ook stik in te kap. En ek besluit toe wel... Ek weet nie hoeveel skoot is nog my revolver nie, ek gaan het leeg skiet en ek skiet het toe leeg. Want het geweet hulle gaan my met my revolver dood skiet. En eventually toe breek hulle die deur oop en toe hulle my deur met die pik steel. En toe val hulle my aan met die pik steel my dood te steek. Het my, as ek gekeer het, het in my, in my arm daar raak gesteek, soos ek daar gekeer het, soos ek in my arm raak. En um, sy heel eerste woord aan my was, ek is hier om jou dood te maak, ek gaan jou dood maak. En toe sê ek van, jylle kan ons nie, jylle nie kinders van die Heere nie, jylle kinders is van die Heere, sal jylle ons nie doen. En dit het om die persoon, die een persoon, nog meer kwater gemaakt. En toe begin my aan te rond met die feiste. Het my verskrikkelijk al gerond op my gezicht, my lijf, uit my geskop, uit alles gedoen. En toe val ek op die mat. En toe bekijk oor my maar toe hy soek oor my bik maar toe probeer my slaabroek van my afkry en ek hou my slaabroek vast en hy skop my en hy dwing my beer op my voorde skere my uiteindelik my slaabroek van my lijf af Dus ek my man toe gelik en ek is een kree. 
Nee, niet doet niet. Ze ben je altijd in zin zeggen, gewoon je doet het ik ga je doet het En tu... Penetreer in mij. En tu... Maar ik heb zo geskoppen, gespartel. Toen begon mij te verwerg. En toen penetreer in mij voor die tweede keer. En ik het ook... Het is mijn gevoel of ik mijn bewustzijn verloor. Want ik al wat ik onthoud, is mijn kop het zo geval. Nou, en toen dat mij verkracht. En toen dit voorbij is. Toen um, grip ik mij aan mijn haren. Toen doen ik mij. Toen zegt mij, zoek zijn boekie. Zoek maar wat zijn boekie. Want dit is die boekie wat ik toen onder mijn bed ingeskop het. Want dit het door mijn gedachten gegaan. Dit is toch een bewijs voor mij. En ik heb gekeken, maar mijn oor was zo so toegeswel, zoals ze mij ongerand en geslaan het, dat ik dit niet kon zien. Nie. En ik heb voor hem geprobeerd hoe hij kan zelf kijken. Hij was een beetje. En toen alleen die bakjes beginnen te zien, al kom. Toen vlijt hij vol. En toen ik uit mijn revolver in mijn kop toe gedrukt. En gewoon ook nog was hij mee betrouwen en die man is zo mij door te schieten. En toen dwong hij mij om die dieren, wat hij, die gaten en die, die groot gat in mijn kamer dier, om hem op te sluiten. Ik moest die sekuriteitsdier kom opsluit het, want dat om omgebuig om onder die dier te klim. Ik moest om toen nou opsluit om toe haar te bij. Om een neefje wat uit mijn mens wees door mij gesteel. Ik <laughs> kijk met andere oor nou door die wereld. Ik kan niet mijzelf wees nie. Maar dan kan ik ooit weer mijzelf wees. Die, uh, die stress. Die vries. En toen het hulle mos ontstap ook weer. En um, toe is ek in een waarbond. Toe, toe voelt of ik wel mal word. Want toe is ek mal gelijk kom weer vir my. En ja, ik zie de zielkundige wat mij ontzettend bij je help. Um, om jullie dingen te verwerken. Maar dat is niet makkelijk. Nie. Um, dan gebeuren incidenten. Dan krap het weer jouw wonden op. En um, elke dag, ik vat het niet dag voor dag. Um, ik krijg een plank van mijn emoties. Ik ben dus een man te meer maanden. Maar ik kan niet. Dit is onbeschrijfelijk. Dit wat ik aan mij ga doen. De impact van een farm attack like this, like Blackies, is zo, so, zo so big. On the long term. That you have to step by step guide her and say and and it's baby steps it's not like within a month you say okay i'm fine now let me go on let me go back to the farm and let me start over again or let me sell the farm and let me start over again because what i sometimes find we will go a step or two step forward and then within the next session something might happen another farm attack or she will watch it a program on TV which is a little bit too aggressive, then she says stay back, then we have to take her. And that to me is the most difficult message to give to people because they can't see this. It's not an arm or a leg, a pain that you can see. And if you look at her and put on the makeup and everything is fine, you can't see that fear, that pain, that anger that struggle that she's busy with in her, in her healing process.
Ons maak so negeer in die ande maak ons klaar. En as ons klaag melk het, dan uh, rui my werkers altyd met die, uh, met die bakkie huis toe. Uh, ons het 54 werkers in dienst en allemaal bly nog hier by ons op die plaas. Ons het hulle in die dorp toegesteer soos baie ander boere nie, maar nie geer toe die bakkie bezig is om weg te rui. Toe ek daar om die hoek kom, toe kom ek reg uit na hierdie garage toe aangestap en terwijl ek na die garage toe geloop het, het ek opgekyk en het ek dadelijk achter gekom, my honde is nie by my nie. Ek het honde wat elke dag saam met my is, by die stal die hele tyd. Uh, ons begin so 4.30 in die moore te melk, en ons maak vanavond so 8 uur kant klaar. Toe ek hier om hier kom, toe kom my onder die licht uit. Die groot licht wat daar boe is, uh, onder hom is dit donker. En uh, toe staan hy in die donker, en hy kom uit die donker uit, en toe ek kom sien, Toe besef ek, hier is een probleem, want my onde is nie by my nie. Maar die ouwe het in die licht gekom, toe gaan staan hy met sy arm so gevou. En terwijl hy met sy arm so gevou staan, toe besef ek, en ek vraag vir hom, wat zoek jy? En toe ek voorhoor buk, toe twee ouwens van achteraf gekom, ek neem aan die een het achter my geloop, en die ander een ons het so een klein waterdekkie gehad, het achtergekom, met my rug na hulle toe, na my gezicht na hierdie auto is ek direct oor my kop geslaan met een baie zwaar voorwerp maar met die vraag wat maak jy hier het hy my amper op die kroentje het hy my kop veel afgeskal ek het drie ouwe op die kop gekry en ek het op my linkersy omgedop toe ek op my linkersy val toe was ek nie bewusteloos gewees nie een van hulle het op my heep geklim die ander een het met sy knieg die my kop gedruk en hy het my, my die knieg wat hy vastgetrek het, het hy my hier drie keer keel afgesnui. En uh, met die snui hier so, is my stembande definitief beskadig. Nee, maar ek gooi hulle toe af, want het was vijf jong mannetjes gewees. En toe ek opvlie, toe ek opstaan, toe ek my kop so draait, is by die bloed die uit aan mekaar. En ek besef toe, ek is bezig om kwaai te bloei. Maar ach, die adrenaline pomp en ek het toe begin beklui. Ek het die vinger afgeslaan en ek het 39 steke, maar hoofdzakelijk op my linkerarm, soos ek gekeer het en beklui het, het die ander my van achteraf begin steek en het ek geweldige steekplekke opgedoen, maar op een kol het ek al zwakker geword. Wees die bloed, want as ek my kop so hou, dan spuit die bloed nie. En hier recht voor die tubbelgaraad, net voor ek die huis aan gegaan het, het ek toch gehoor hoe gaan die honde binnen in die huis te kere en uh, het ek later besef ek gaan net nie maak nie ek besef toe ek moest tussen die twee karre in beweeg het dan was daar net de voorkant gewees maar terwijl ander mens hier van achteraf steek en die ander van vooraf beklui het jy nie rarig hou op sien nie, val gaan jy val nou op die eind van die dag toe bid ek want ek is a, Ek is een christen en ek glo, God help ons. En ek sê, toe help my, en dadelijk is het, soos een stem in die hemel uit. En wat vir my sê, speel dood. Ek druk toe my hand, my haar toe, en ek val toe en ek gaan leestel. Daar het hulle my geskop en nog gesteek, tot hulle later my gelos. Wat ek toe weer al gedoen het is, ek het opgestaan en so wankel, wankel, by daar die ek hier ingegaan is hy ekkie wat na ons vierkant toe gaan en op de ijs daar hy met my vrou wakker geword <coughs> van die honde wat so binnen die ijs te kere gegaan het toe sy in die gang afloop die ijs gang venster kon sy sien twee manne staan voor die kombuis deur staan hulle en slaan aan die deur ook twee jong mannetjies maar toe sy die ijs binnenhofse deur van ons hoop maak storm ons honde toe uit wat altyd saam met ons in die huis bly en een van hulle is toe twee keer raak gesteek maar hulle toe die mense verwilder en op die huis daarheen was ek in die vierkant gewees en het sy my verder in die huis ingetrek sonder om bang te wees niks aan die lewe nie en ek het toe nou wakker geword van die geblaaf en vir hulle sê jy weet dat hulle moet stil bly en so maar toe hou hulle aan en toe besef ek maar hier is 
iets verkeerd, want die geblaf was anders, als wat hulle so, bijvoorbeeld blaf is, hier katpuit is, of so iets. So, um, ek het onmiddellik opgespring, en toe ek op my cellfoon kyk, toe sien ek is 9 of 5, so dit was 5 oor 9, en toe ek by die gangvenster kom, toe kyk ek, toe sien ek, hier staan een met de mes vir my, so in wacht, hier voor die achterdeur. Toe sien ek my Johannes in die binnenhof, en daar aan die ander kant van die meer staan vier of zwart is. En uh, toe besef ek onmiddellik, daar is fout. En toe het ek gehaard loop vir die deur, en uh, die deur oopgemaak, en terwijl ek die honde laat uitstorm het, het ek ook, en toe ek by hom kom in die binnenhof, toe sê hy net, ou nou jy met my help, hulle slaan my dood. My wife got a call because my phone was um, on charge and I just suddenly saw her face becoming pale and um, it was Johan's wife on the phone screaming, they're going to kill him, they're going to kill him, we must come. Um, and then luckily he's my, my neighbour, we live about two kilometres away and luckily my neighbour just next to me is a sister. So um, we went there together. When we got there it was just blood everywhere. Um, I didn't think that was a living person with that much blood on the floor. Um, if I, I, I can't even tell you how much blood it was, but it was just blood everywhere. Um, picked up Johan, Johan was still breathing, um, just told me, yeah, yeah, I'm bleeding here, yeah, showing to his neck. And when I picked up his shirt, it was just a pulsating mass of blood coming out of his neck. When I saw him the first time, I s sort of stood back and just said to myself, it's, there's no chance this guy can make it. So what I did then is um, we took a few drips, uh, put a few drips up. He was in such a shock. I usually know I've drawn blood from him a lot of times. I know where his veins are. He has big veins. He had nothing at that time. We phoned the ambulance. The ambulance wasn't there. So what we did, decided to do is to put him on, on a mattress. Luckily, there was a lot of people because Johan is quite a big guy. Um, and I was worried about this neck wound, so we were just pressing on that neck wound. The sister was helping with that. My wife on the other side with the drips. Luckily, we know um, about what to do and how to react. And uh, we were busy resussing Johan, putting him on a mattress, put him on the back of a bucky, single cab, normal bucky um, with a canopy. And we drove him to the health center here in De La Rebel. Got to the health center, um, took him inside, and um, we didn't receive a lot of help from the, from the staff there, but luckily we were already a few people involved with uh, the necessary uh, expertise to help. So we put more drips on. Um, we ran about eight liters of normal water through him in a question of two hours. At that time I could examine his wounds. He had multiple stab wounds, stab wounds, cut wounds, he was bleeding from everywhere, back, front, chest, abdomen, um, neck. Uh, it, when I saw the, the wounds on his face, it looked like they stabbed him inside his nose, inside his ear, and tried to cut his throat because he had a nice big cut wound around his throat. So um, when, I, when I stabilized Johan, he would actually tell me, yes, they tried to cut my throat. They tried to cut my throat. There were four or five people and they tried to cut my throat. Um, so then he was bleeding so profusely that I had to actually um, put in sutures to stop the bleeding. Um, there was so much blood I couldn't really think about it, I just had to stop the bleeding. When I stopped the bleeding eventually everything calmed down. So what we did is um, one of the people in town actually has a VW combi. So we um, asked him to come. He came, we put in the mattress, we got oxygen, drips up everywhere, checked his sugar, phoned the ambulance. The ambulance said they're coming. So we took him with the combi so long to Clarkstorp, so one, about 120 k's from here. Um, organized with the ambulance to get us halfway. Ambulance came, we stopped halfway, they got in the paramedics. Um, and they said, no, he's actually already stabilized enough. We can just drive through with a combi. So what they did is they just gave us the lights and we went to Clarkstorp. At Clarkstorp, uh, we handed him over. He was sort of stable, but still very sick. And they took him to theater and um, luckily he's alive. And then they pulled me up and they threw me next to my husband lying there on the ground. So he was lying on his tummy and he was um, uh, uh, bound with um, cord or something. You know. Then I kind of realised they were going to, well he was 
gonna rape me, I think. Um, well, that's what he was saying. But in that moment when um, he said about the boiling water and going to rape, um, you know, I, okay, then he grabbed me on my, my belt buckle and pulled me up, I mean, and he dropped me. And then he went and pulled up my clothes, you know, and said, take off, take off. But then my hands were still, you know, in the, in the scarf. So then I loosened myself. I could have, but I, I rather stayed like that. Then I loosened it. And then I took my phone. And then he said, what have you got? Because I kind of thought I could hide the phone higher up or whatever so that I can get help sometime, you know. So um, then he took my phone and he was busy with my phone. And then I thought I better just call my husband, you know. So I looked at him and I and um, and I, I accepted for him, Akisli for you, you know, I love you. And he said, I love you. And then this guy just shot him. I mean, he just shot him, you know. And I was like, and then I just got up, you know, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. So I just screamed at them and said, Get out of my house in Jesus' name. Just get out of my house. And I was trying to get him out of the blood because he, were, he couldn't breathe, and it, but it was just blood, it was just blood. And I, I kind of turned him around and then I just felt a warm, hot, uh, hard, and then they shot, well, I don't know who shot me, um, and then I don't know with what um, gun or whatever. So, and then I was like thinking, okay, is this the end now? <laughs> is this is how it's gonna be? We still wanted to do so much. Vier uur die middag raak, dan begin mense al dink, ja, jy moet nou huis toe gaan, want wat asof het weer kan gebeur met iemand anders te en dis die groot ding, ons sorg ook, en ons is baie nabe aan die, soos die plaaswerkers en alles, so dit is een moeilike ding om nie vir hulle ook kwaad te wees, nie, want dis nie hulle wat het gedoen het, die, dit is anders om die vertrouwensband met hulle te hou, en dis hoe ek ook, die groot ding is wat my baie nou pla is, want net omdat dit gebeur het, moet alles verander op die plaas, die, dit met veiligheid moet opgeskerp word, die mense moet rondgetrek word, dis nie net ons die allemaal in die omgeving sy veiligheid word opgeskerp en word ber- ge- geraak aan hierdie situasie wat gebeur het. Buiten al die hartseer en alles wat daar nou is, is dit jy is heel te mal ontwrig uit jou gemakzone waar jy was. Nou is dit die heel te mal ander omgeving waar toe ons moet kom. Ja, ons het altijd op die plaas gekom, maar dit is een ander plek as jy moet kom bly. Dit is totaal en al ontwrichting vir allemaal. Elke moet nou weer moet trek, daar is nou, soos hy gesê, daar moet nou hier veilig gemaakt word. Jy gaan die heel tyd wonder, um, is dit veilig genoeg? As hulle een keer kon inkom, kan hulle weer. As het baie goed sam met die bas gaan werk. Baie goed, baie goed. Hy was altyd as daar moeilik het, dan sê, laat wacht bykie. Laat ons eerst maar bykie denk. Tot laat ons bykie koel word, dan kom ons weer, dan praat ons, dan gaat aan met die werk. As daar voelt is, ons sit neer, ons maak om recht. Tot laat recht wees, dan gaat ons aan met die werk. I think there is definitely a political influence sometimes because there are things that are said by certain politicians and we can see it in North West. As soon as Supra said the things he did about white people, farm attacks increased drastically. It's a fact. Um, we did a report earlier this year and if you go look at political utterances by people like Julius Malema, Andile from Black First, Land First, you can see if they said something on a prominent media base, we can see the attacks increase within the three to four days after that. So there is a definite influence. Um, whether it is that they are literally meeting every week to say let's hit those farms, I can't tell you that. But what I can say is that there is a definite influence between what's said in politics and what is done um, on on farms. Um, it also happened, and it's happened now in Northwest and end of 2015, where attackers walk into a house and in Afrikaans, South African attacker says to the farmer, "My lemma sent us." Now whether he says that to scare people, to intimidate them, regardless. The point is that message is spread and people that aren't schooled properly, um, that are exposed to violence at a very young age, have a higher chance of saying something like that and committing a violent crime than what someone else would have done. We're doing an inventory now of who owns what in South Africa. We're paying a lot of money to actually get that done, to once and for all 
you know, demystify the story of who owns what. And in that, you have to work in the amount of money that was paid out to land reform, million fisheries, and so on. Otherwise, it's just not a, you know, it's not a transparent and a sensible thing to do. Um, so, so I think the sense of insecurity that's being created, the sense of racial polarization that's being created is very concerning because that's not what, what we signed up for in 1994. Uh, and given the dynamics in the political environment at the moment, there, there's obviously certain slants. Uh, the Black Land First movement, the EFF has made some calls. Uh, so, so that creates a sense of tension within, within a farming community and, and inhabitants. Uh, and that is something that is that is not going to take South Africa forward. And, and, and as we've seen in Zimbabwe, that actually leads to the regress of a whole economy, of the wealth of people, of job opportunities. We want to flip the thing around and say, listen, agriculture is the prime motivator for job creation, for economic growth, for food security, for export growth. And we firmly believe that it's probably the best sector in South Africa if looked after properly, that can actually achieve that. And with that, you know, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. And with that comes things like transformation in the sector, more stakeholders that has an interest. Um, and, and that would also change the landscape, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. That's things like these take time. We agree that the government is not fulfilling its obligations in terms of our safety. I mean, if they were, we should not have seen the huge increases in crime that we've seen since 2011-12. And this is happening on a year-on-year -year basis. So every year, our crime goes up. And all the indications are that when the police releases their crime stats now in September this year, we'll see another increase. I have no doubt in my mind. Already in, by when they released their first three quarters in January, there was another increase of about 6.9 in terms of aggravated robbery, which tells us that that will add also to the uh, increases that we've seen in our murder rate. So there's no good news uh, at the moment as far as our security is concerned. And we know that the, that the criminal justice system is, is currently not functioning optimally. This is a debate all on its own. We've seen that government doesn't do what they can do or what they should do. If you go and look at uh, training modules in the police, um, if you look at the last internal audit report for 2012-2013, it's clear that in Becky Taylor's time as National Commissioner, he removed about eight or nine training modules out of normal operational training procedures for the police. So that includes handling a shotgun, tactical handling of a shotgun, um, tactical communication on a radio, um, handling of a roadblock, the approach to a roadblock. So it's really basic things that they've removed uh, that can make a massive difference in policing. And the only reason they did it was to uh, get more people onto uh, or get more police officers. So what they did for the World Cup specifically um, is that usually a police officer would get, you know, two chances to pass his exam and, and then become an officer um, or an official. What happened here was some of them wrote four times. They failed all four times until his administration and the police still put them through. Well, everybody's concerned. Any, every normal South African citizen is concerned about uh, the level of crime in our, current, in our country. And it's even worse uh, in case of rural safety because farmers uh, by nature they are not staying like other people in urban areas where you have got a neighbor just next to your shoulder. In the rural setup, uh, in the farming setup, you find that one farmer is alone there, and then you get another farmer, another 20 uh, or, or 10 kilometers away. Obviously, it makes farmers to be very vulnerable to to attacks by criminals uh, and, uh, and other uh, vagabonds in the farming areas. It's very important for us to try and put solutions on the table. Um, I mean, so far we haven't had any resistance. I mean, we've actually made a lot of progress in terms of having the executive conversations and agreements with them. Um, how that translates into practice on, on the farms is another issue. 
Uh, we've got a trust fund called the Agri Securitas Trust where we actually invest in farm safety. So farmers would apply for funding for camera systems or awareness systems, etc. And we would fund it out of that trust fund, uh, which is a small drop in the ocean, but at least it's a contribution to the farming community, uh, all farming communities, for them to, to, to actually equip themselves with safety equipment so that they could prevent farm attacks. If you look at the police, um, from top to bottom, we've got a massive shortage of, of, of knowledge in the police. We've lost many people that were very knowledgeable. Uh, a lot of them have left because of politics as well. You, if you don't know the right people, and especially if you're white in the South African police service, um, you will not get promoted very easily. Um, and if you're black and, um, and you are uh, very good at your job, it seems as though many a time promotions for those officers are, are not done um, because they're not politically, correct, uh, politically connected enough. So you should look at the South African Police Service. I mean, it's an organization of almost 200,000 people. About 152,000 are functional police members. But the rot in terms of this organization is so big in terms of corruption, in terms of poor appointments, in terms of various other criminal activities, um, that it's, 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 it's a huge challenge, I think, to, to change the situation around. So you would probably have to start by some of the things, by doing some of the things that the National Development Plan already recommends. And that is you will have to go and um, do an assessment in terms of the officers from the top downwards, whether they meet the requirements for each of those key positions that they occupy. And if you find them, find them to be lacking, you must either train them properly or replace them with someone who is suitably qualified. That is not the case in the police service at the moment. Then you'll have to address the problem with grassroots corruption uh, in the police service. Because that has a lot to do with public confidence and trust in the police service. But you first have to fix the leadership. Once the leadership is where it should be, you go down and you do the same thing at every level, right up to grassroots level. It's a national cry that uh, our government is not very efficient and good in implementing any of its policies, programs, strategies, and even legislation for that matter, enforce and even implement. So I wouldn't really put it that it's a, it's a specific weakness towards uh, protecting farmers or rural safety. I would say it's a general weakness of our country in terms of implementing its own plans and programs. There is a plan, I agree with you, which we, we took as organized agriculture together with the government. But unfortunately, it is not uh, really implemented. Maar van die aanval af as ek, ek moet sal pille drink. En ek, ek kan bedags nie buiten kan beweeg nie, want ek is juist bang vir die dag. En uh, ek hou my, my dier en my altyd gesluit en ek het al gevoel ek, ek lei het leven van een kleisenaar. Ons het net dadelijk besluit dat ons moet vrede maak met dit en aangaan met ons leven soos ons altijd aangegaan het. Daar ook nou net bykie meer veiligheidsbewus is wat ons altijd was. En, uh, want dit helpt toch nie ons leven met de haat binnen in ons en hulle loop daar rond en hulle gaan met hulle gewone levens aan nie. En op eend is ons siek en so. Maar dit het een geweldige impact want ek moest terug gaan school toe om net eerst te sien dat die school oopmaak en dan in die gang kom en so. En uh, dit is, ek is daar maak, is so bekommerd, want hy is hier by die huis, en jy weet nie wanneer gaan met alles wat hulle gedoen het, soos met die stembande wat hulle afgesnijd, wat hy aan mekaar verstuk, dubbele visie wat Johan het, wat ons bestuur het, um, as ek bestuur, dan sien hy dubbele karre van vooraf kom, en dan raak hy maar bykie paniekerig, want hy dink, daar kom een karre voorbij, en ons gaan een kop en kop botsing wees, En uh, tot nou nog, um, ek krij maar gedierig nachtmeries en dan don, denk jy, kon jy dit nie maar anders gedoen het, maar hy lewe. Dit is die belangrijkste van alles, hy lewe. Maar ek het uit al die bestuur uit bedank. Uh, Aanvankelijk het ons besluit om nie meer die melkrij aan te gaan nie. Want ons het een geweldige verlies gehad op ons koeie 
vir die hele rik is die koeie nou nie gins meneer nie, en die voeding is nie soos aangepas is wat ons dit gewoond is nie. Die maatskapie, die is maatskapie, die is voere, het ongelooflik hulle voeding kunnige twee keer een week gekom en die voeding aangepas. As jy sien wat so ondersteuning jy van die mense om jou gekry het, maar wat ons wel achtergekom het is, ach ons vriende, sonder om name te noem, het, het ook begin, begin nog optree, ons dra vier wapens, jy, jy is in het ding wat jy nie in wil wees nie, ek wil nie altyd allemaal bevraag teken nie, waar ons baie keer breinboere gehelp het, uh, om skaap en beeste te kry vir, vir, vir uh, begrafnisse, is dit gestop, want jy wil nie meer hee, mense moet op jou werf kom nie. It will be very bad if we allow farm murders and the escalation of what's happening here to divide us more. Because that will, in the end, the division between us will, in the end, not be conducive for any community. And it will affect the safety and security of all of us. So that is not what we want. But what I can only hope is that, in a way, our government will take responsibility because it's our fundamental constitutional human right to live in a safe community. And then I, I couldn't even see my, my, my son and they kept him outside and that was difficult. Um, and I suppose he wanted to see his dad and he couldn't. Um, and then they took me outside and I, we waited for the ambulance and I had to get into the ambulance and uh, I just asked um, now I'm ready to look after Christo and if my little grandson was okay and so on. And, um, and then of course getting into the ambulance was, um, <laughs> it felt so cold and so on. But it was, it was um, the most loneliest feeling ever. Weet jy, die ondersteuning wat ek van allemaal gekry het, en my vriend, is wonderlik, dit draal my, dit draal my elke dag. Oh, is het nu moeilijk? Maar het draal my. Wat was het die vir? Die gemeenskap, die hele Zuid-Afrika. Selfs mense van oorzee wat my gekontak het, of my Whatsapps gestuur het. Um, ek het nooit gedink, dat al soveel mense, is wat vir mense omgegee, of jou bid, and then I start dealing with the loss, how to, to confront the pain. The, um, she couldn't stay on the farm. That loss of income, that loss of her, my house, my, my belongings, my freedom, all of that, we had to deal with that. And obviously then I go and look at confronting the emotions, the fear, the anger, the hatred. You cannot but feel angry towards these people. You cannot but hate them, even if it's only for a while. And then I allow that to happen in a safe environment of my, of my rooms. Otherwise, if you do not allow that to come out, uh, eventually it will manifest in public. And I have to make sure as the therapist to allow and to help that patient to get rid of that emotion and to confront that emotion, to, to, to let it out. And then, I have to guide a person to forgiveness. And that's the most difficult one. Uh, especially if you look at the, at the violence of the crime. To, to, to get to that point where you make the decision to say, I am going to forgive that person. Obviously, I explain the process and I allow that process to happen. It's not an overnight thing that you can just stand up and say, okay, I forgive you. And I allow that process to happen. And then the most difficult part is to reconstruct your life. Because you never, after an incident like that, you never can go back to your old normal. There was this um, young black guy pushing the, um, my, tr my bed and um, I just said, give me your hand. I just need to hold your hand. And he was like this, you know, and I thought, 
ach, jy weet nie, you don't know what I've gone through, I need to do this for reconciliation. And afterwards, when he fetched me and he heard what happened, he was, he really changed. And then, you know, he took my hand. So, um, this is what God wants to do in our country. But there are people that don't walk there. And it's, it shouldn't be a color, a color thing. It's a hard attitude. But as far as our farming outputs are concerned, we benchmark with the best in the world. We probably have the best farmers in the world because our farmers are doing extremely well. Our export growth has been growing rapidly. Um, our productivity is on par with any farmers or other farming sectors in the world. We've got some of the best genetics here. We've got good research and development. Multinationals are investing heavily in South Africa. So by and large, we're doing very well as a farming sector. Um, the, could we do a lot better if we had a more enabling environment and more enabling policy and legislation and a safer environment? Yes, we could, for sure. Ek is daar gebore, dus ek is die derde geslag wat op die grond bly. Ons het die grond nergens gesteel nie, ek het gewerk daarvoor, ek het die grond gekoop en betaal. Waaiend sal ek gaan, ek, dis my, ek het, ek het gaan studeer om een boer te wees. Dis my werk. Ek het nie een kees, waaiend sal ek gaan. Dis my land, dis my, dis my plek, en dis my mense, so ja, ek sal my nergens heen gaan. Productive commercial farmers are one of our country's biggest assets. The loss of this sector will come at an incalculable price.